Hey, what's up? Today, I'm gonna show you how to make restaurant level pan roasted chicken at home. The process is time consuming. It will probably smoke up your house and it'll push you way out of your comfort zone in terms of technique. But the final result is very, very worth it. And if you guys are looking to make the best tasting chicken dish of your life, then this is it. The most time consuming step of this entire process is making the super intensely flavorful chicken jus. So at least 24 hours prior to our chicken dinner, I'm gonna make some very fortified roasted chicken stock. For that, I've got five to six pounds of chicken backs here that I'm laying out on a sheet tray to roast. If you can't find these at your regular grocery store, I would say check your Asian grocery because they almost always have chicken bones on hand and they also have these, chicken feet. I'm adding about a pound's worth of these feet to my stock because they have a ton of gelatin in them and that's mainly what gives this sauce its final viscosity. From here, I'm gonna load this tray into a 475F oven to roast for about 30 to 40 minutes. Next, the vegetables or mirepoix. For me, that means one whole large onion and you'll notice that I'm not peeling it. There's no need to do that in my opinion because this is just gonna be in stock. We're gonna be straining it out and we're not gonna be eating it. Next, I'll rough chop three to four carrots. Again, no peeling for the same reason. Then I'll grab three to four stalks of celery, cut off the stem and then rough chop. Lastly, I'll throw a leek into the mix here for a little variation and because I had one left over from a previous video, I lost the stem and the sandy bottom and then I cut it in half and then gave it a rinse to remove any dirt in between the layers. That gets a rough chop and once the mirepoix is all broken down, I'll scoot it onto a sheet tray, give it a quick squirt of olive oil to help transfer some heat to the vegetables while they roast, then toss to combine and then load into the same 475F oven to roast alongside the chicken bones. After 30 to 40 minutes, these bones have caught a really hard roast and are starting to glaze up the sheet tray with some chicken gunk, so I'll pull them out. While I'm at it, I'll pull the veggies as well and make sure that the bones are at least as roasty as mine are here. Any less and you'll have a blonde, less flavorful chicken stock. Now to make this stock, I'm gonna grab my slow cooker. I prefer this method to a stock pot on the stovetop because it's passive. I'm gonna be cooking the stock for a really long time and I don't wanna baby the burner on the stove to make sure the stock isn't boiling too hard or is not boiling enough. This gets the job done with just the push of a button. Once my chicken bones are loaded into the pot, I'll need to discard of all of this rendered fat. Then I'll add about a quart of water onto the sheet tray and then grab a wooden spoon and start scraping up the fond on that pan to deglaze it. There's a ton of chicken essence baked onto this tray right now and not deglazing will lead to a noticeably weaker stock with less intense flavor and a lighter color. After I've got most of that fond scraped up in the pot it goes, then in go my roasted vegetables. I'll deglaze the veg tray, in goes the vegetable water. Then lastly, I'll add a tablespoon's worth or 25 grams of tomato paste. This adds a savory, robust backbone to the stock overall. Lastly, I'll add in enough water to cover everything. That's about four to five liters or five quarts in total. Then the lid goes on and I'll slow cook this stock for 12 hours or overnight. The next day, when I pop the top, you can see I've got a deeply golden brown stock that's full of body from the chicken feet and when reduced is gonna make an extremely chicken flavored sauce. Next, I'm gonna strain it through my fine mesh chinois, then use a ladle to scoop off as much of the fat from the top of this stock as I can. We're gonna be simmering this stuff on the stove pretty hard later on and if there's excessive fat, the violence of the simmer is gonna emulsify that fat into the stock and that tastes really bad. For now, I'm gonna throw this stock into the fridge so that I can make a flavorful herb brine for my chicken. For that, I'll grab a little saucepan and into it combine a thousand grams or about a liter of water, then 150 grams of salt, 50 grams of sugar, two bay leaves, a whole head of garlic that I've halved. Oh, this one is rotten. Another whole head of garlic. This one's a little green inside, but it'll work. Then I'm gonna grab a clamshell of what's called poultry blend. It's just fresh rosemary, thyme, and sage all packaged together, and it saves me for having to buy a single clamshell of any one herb. It's super handy. Now into the pot it goes, and then the pot goes over to the stove. I'll bring that up to a simmer, and once it is, I'll cook for 10 minutes to infuse this water with as much garlic and herb flavor as possible. Then I'll kill the heat and let it steep like tea for another five to 10 minutes. While that cools, I'm gonna grab a four quart container and into it add a thousand grams grams of ice. Next, I'll pour the hot brine over the ice, and once that's melted, I've got a brine that is ready to use right away and has the correct salinity to make these chickens seasoned throughout, but not salty. For now, I'm gonna set this to the side and get started on the actual chicken part of this whole dish. For that, I've got one medium-sized whole roasting chicken. It's about three pounds or one and a half kilos in total, and to make it a little easier to butcher, I'm gonna dab as much of the chicken juice off the outside as possible because that's gonna make it just less slippery. 
Now, I'm gonna show you guys how to make a boneless half chicken with all of the skin still connected. To get started, I'm gonna use a filleting knife or something thin and sharp to cut down the breast bone on one side. As you cut this first breast off of the carcass, let the rib cage guide your knife. Make small slices every inch or so, and eventually you'll expose the bottom of the breast and the wing socket. See that little gap with the round ball bone on the left side? That's where the wing attaches to the breast, and I'm gonna cut to the right side of it to free the entire wing-breast combo from the carcass. And there we go. Now I'm gonna use my hands to separate it a little bit more. And then next, I'll grab the breast and then cut the skin down the line of the spine straight towards the leg quarter. Then the chicken goes back on its back, and then I'll grab the leg quarter, bend it until the leg pops out of the socket like this, then I'll keep the leg in hand and then carefully cut through the thigh socket with my knife to remove the entire half of the chicken from the carcass. And that's how you get a bone in half chicken. Now to debone it is a little bit more work. First, I'm gonna lop off the wing end at the drummy joint like this, save that for stock or eat it. Then to debone the leg thigh, I'm gonna make an incision that follows the bone line on the drumstick up through the thigh. Once it's opened up like this, I'm gonna clean the bone on the other side so that it's revealed even more. I'll keep doing that until both bones are exposed and the meat is peeled back a little bit. And from here, the explanation gets kind of hard to do, but the gist is carefully remove the double bone from the joint part. Then once it's free, clean the meat off the bone and cut through the tendony end on the drumstick side to get a double bone out of the leg thigh combo. And yeah, that's a boneless half chicken. It takes some practice and is surely a professional level move, but I thought it'd be fun to show you guys how it's done in a high-end restaurant. I used to butcher like 20 to 30 of these a day, and I think it's kind of fun. Let me know in the comments if you guys like or dislike seeing this kind of higher end technique in video sometimes. Next, I'll drop both boned out halves of this chicken into the brine. And by the way, this brine will hold up to four halves if you wanna do two whole birds worth of meat. And from here, I'm gonna brine these chickens for four hours. I'm using a wet brine here instead of a straight salt brine, also known as a dry brine, because this meat is boneless and is gonna be exposed to very high temperatures. In that set of circumstances, it really helps to use osmosis to our advantage to get some additional water weight into the meat, especially the breast meat. Dry brines in general are better suited for chicken that's cooked at lower temperatures temps under the cover of skin and on the bone. Four hours later, my chicken halves are all seasoned up, so I'm gonna move them over to a double layer of paper towel on a sheet tray to drain off as much of the water as I can. Part of the rare glory of this dish is the perfectly rendered, seared, and roasted chicken skin that just isn't possible if it's wet, so we need to take extra care to dry the entire thing off as much as we can. Also, it's gonna be laid into a very, very hot pan full of oil, and if it's wet, it's gonna get splattery and burn you badly. If you wanna get real wild and crazy, use a blow dryer on the cold setting to dry out the skin even more. And yes, I have done this in restaurants on my station and it works. What? Which blow dryer is that? Not the nice one. Okay, the chicken is ready for the pan, but the sauce to cover it is not. So the brine birds will go back into the fridge to further dry out while I make my all time favorite meat based sauce, pure unadulterated reduced chicken jus. Speaking of pure, unadulterated, meat-based things, look at all this delicious meat that I just got from the sponsor of this video, ButcherBox. ButcherBox is a subscription that delivers high-quality, humanely raised meat to your doorstep. You've heard me talk about ButcherBox a lot on this channel, and I keep talking about them because this is a brand with great quality product that I actually use all the time. ButcherBox meat includes 100% grass-fed beef, free-range organic chicken, humanely raised pork, and wild-caught seafood, all of which are the types of meat that Lauren and I want to buy when we're shopping for regular groceries but our nearest grocery store doesn't have any of that stuff. So it's been really nice to have ButcherBox as the consistent source of high quality meat that we keep stocked in our freezer. With ButcherBox, you can choose the box option and delivery frequency that works best for you. And then either let ButcherBox choose the selection of meats, or if you're looking for something specific, you can choose the custom box. That way you can get things that you might not be able to find at your local grocery store, like cold cracked lobster meat. And oh yeah, for a limited time, ButcherBox is offering new members free lobster meat and New York strips. So to get all that free meat, click the link in my description and sign up for ButcherBox. You'll get two 10 ounce New York strips and eight ounces of that sweet cold cracked lobster claw and knuckle meat for free with your first order. The link is in my description. Thank you, ButcherBox. Now let's get back to that stock that we made earlier. I moved it over to a heavy bottom pot and then put it on the stove so that I could evaporate it or reduce it for about an hour until it's reached a sticky syrupy state that in French cooking is referred to as a gloss or a glaze. And if you're wondering, hey Bri, what if my stock didn't have those chicken feet? 
Luckily, meat gelatin is available for sale at your grocery store in powdered form. For a four quart batch of stock like this one, I think three to four packets of gelatin is a good starting point. And I'll just stir those into some warm water to get them dissolved and then stir that into my hot reducing stock. From here, I'm gonna continue to cook this for about 45 minutes to another hour. One hour later, after reducing the stock over gentle medium heat, the bubbles are starting to get shiny and big. And when I push my spatula through the glaze, it leaves a trail. That's how you know it's got the body to be a proper French style meat sauce. If yours isn't this thick, no sweat, just keep reducing or add a little bit more of that gelatin. Next, because this is actually a sauce now, I'm gonna move it over to a little saucepan that makes finishing it and moving it around a lot easier. And the good news is that this is way more chicken gloss than we would need for even four big half chicken. So I'm gonna split it in half and then freeze the other half for the next time I wanna make delicious, incredibly flavorful chicken sauce. For now, I'm gonna pop a lid on this little saucepan and move it over to the stove to stay warm whilst I cook my chicken. For that, I'm gonna grab those little chicken halves from the fridge real quick than my largest, most thick-sided saute pan. Today, I'm using a 12-inch fully clad stainless vehicle and I'm dropping it down over high heat. I'll also mention that cast iron will work really well if that's your heaviest bottom pan, but mine smokes a lot and it's black and hard to film. While the pan preheats, I'm gonna preheat my oven to 475F and then I'm gonna turn my vent hood on to high. I can't stress this part enough. Things are gonna get smoky, especially if you don't have a good hood vent. And if you don't have one, have someone standing by your smoke detector to wave it off when it goes off because it definitely will. Once my pan is good and ripping hot, or after about two minutes of preheating, I'm gonna add in about three tablespoons of canola or vegetable oil. Don't use olive or light olive. This is what happens. The smoke point on that stuff is way too low for this gig. And once the canola oil is shimmering, I'll very, very, very carefully lay in my dry half chicken skin side down. A quick press to make sure the skin is in full contact with the pan, and then I'll follow that with a nice firm press on both the breast and the thigh with a spatula to further ensure full on skin contact. After two to three minutes of hard searing, I can see this chicken skin is starting to take on some really nice brown color. So from here, I'm gonna move it over to my 475F oven to roast for about seven to eight minutes. After seven minutes in this very hot oven, you can see the backside of this meat has started to cook through. So I'm gonna pull this out and finish things on the stovetop. This time I'm gonna use medium heat though because I don't wanna dry out the skinless side with excessive heat when I flip it over. Speaking of that, I'm gonna use some tongs to carefully check the skin under this bird. And as you can see, it's delightfully crisped up and deeply golden brown. So I'm gonna flip it over and finish cooking it on the back side. Next, a restaurant amount of butter is gonna go into the pan, like four or five tablespoons, and then a bundle of that fresh poultry herb blend that we used for the brine to drive home the point that this is an herb-based roasted chicken. Next, I'm gonna baste the skin side of this chicken with the butter on and off for about three to four minutes. The butter here does the double duty of both crisping and frying the skin a little bit more and frying the herbs, making them more potent and more easily picked up by the chicken. After three to four minutes of bee baking, Basting, this chicken should be just about cooked through and the skin is clearly nice and crisped up. I'll throw a little thermo into the thickest part of the breast to make sure I'm happy with the temp. 150F looks good. That means the much thinner thigh should be well past 165F. I'll move it over to a wire rack to rest for five to 10 more minutes. One last bath of butter though, of course. Then back over at the stove, I'm gonna move my chicken gloss over some medium heat and then I'll add in four to five tablespoons of butter. To emulsify that into the sauce, I'm just gonna swirl it as it melts. All the gelatin in there is gonna easily grab all that fat and leave us with a ridiculously velvety meaty chicken jew chicken jew look at it oh my lord the last step here is to add some salt finally even perfectly executed sauces are totally boring without it so i'll add a big pinch stir it in and that's how you make a french style meat sauce out of just bones and mirepoix to finish the rested half chicken is going to go on a plate and then a very generous dose of that glossy thick rich robust flavorful chicken jus goes on top of that you guys this chicken is deeply flavored with sage thyme and rosemary a hint of garlic in there rounds things off and the brine has fully seasoned the bird with salt and made it exceptionally juicy yes in true restaurant fashion this dish does require hard work and a lot of time but the final product brings peak human experience as far as chicken is concerned. It's more than just pleasurable, it's actually deeply satisfying. I hope you guys are brave enough to give the whole deal a try soon. I know you can do it. Let me know in the comments what you think. Let's eat this thing.